Well, good morning. As most of you know, we've been studying through the book of Romans, Paul's uh, very important letter. And uh, today we're going to continue in that study. So open your Bible or turn on your Bible to Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26. We're going to look at six verses today. I'm reading from the uh, English Standard Version. Chapter 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a, forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You in Your wonderful plan and providence. You cause Your Word to be inspired and You have protected it all down through the years so that we can open up and up Your Word and realize that this is your word speaking to us. Father, as we center our attention upon the good news today, we pray that you would cause us not to be thinking about things this afternoon and tomorrow and next week or yesterday, but to center our attention on the, on the great news that you're about to unfold before us. We thank you, Lord, that uh, despite all the bad news that we heard in in the first three chapters of this book, that now you're opening up the wonderful gospel, and we pray that you'd help us to see it afresh today, and that we would every day live out the gospel. Father, open our hearts, open our minds, cause us to, to learn from you, to trust you, and to obey you. In Christ's name, amen. I'm going to first go back uh, about 63 years ago. I was just graduating from college, uh, from high school. Uh, that was 1954. And um, I had not planned to go to college. Uh, I planned to go to work for my dad in his insurance office. But uh, I became a Christian, and that changed my whole perspective. And I thought, uh, you know, I need to go to, to a Bible school and learn something about the Scriptures. So a friend of mine I decided he was going to enroll in Washtenaw College, Washtenaw Baptist College in Arkadelphia. So I decided I'd just tag along with him and go there. And so uh, in August, I loaded up my 1948 Chevrolet Coupe and headed off down to Washtenaw College down to Arkadelphia. Uh, I'll tell you how long ago it was. In, in those days, the, college, the tuition, fees, room, and board were $385 a semester. And everybody got a $50 scholarship, so I brought it down to $335 a semester. But I was broke as I could be, and so I borrowed $40 from my dad to go to college. And uh, he told me, he said, I, that was in August, he said, I'll loan it to you, but I want it paid back in October. So I uh, contacted a local insurance office there and got a job typing up policies and issues and endorsements and filling out claim reports and so forth at the great price of 75 cents an hour. About two, eight, two years later, uh, they declared insurance interstate commerce, and so they had to raise me to $1.25 an hour, which was the minimum wages. And my boss then tried to figure out everywhere in the world to get out from around it, but he had to. But anyway, I actually got my dad paid back the $40 within, within two months. Anyway, I enrolled in Washtenaw, and uh, two of the courses that, uh, that you had to take were Western Civilization and American History. And we had two different teachers teaching those, and 
and they were totally different. Dr. Drummond taught Western civilization, and Dr. Drummond seemed like he was just earning a living. He would come into the class, uh, and he would sit down at a desk, and he'd start reading his lectures. He'd read his lectures, and then he'd look out the window. He'd read his lectures, and then he'd look out the window. And uh, my class was at 11 o'clock, and it was above the cafeteria. And you know, most students do not eat breakfast. <laughs> uh, they, they stay in bed just as long as they can and then run to class. Well, as they started cooking lunch, that meal smell would start coming up to the classroom. And before long, there might be just be one or two left in Dr. Drummond's class. I mean, they'd take it as long as they could, and then they had to go get something to eat. But uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Drummond was totally different from, from the next professor, and that was uh, Dr. Daly. Dr. Daly was a very demonstrative teacher. He, uh, he was, uh, he'd wail his arms. One day he picked up the wooden desk. You know, we had wooden desks with arms on it, and you put your books underneath there. And he picked that up and was just gesturing with that wooden desk. And it was a poor young lady sitting on the front row, and he hit her upside the head with the desk. We wondered if she'd go survive it. But anyway, the thing about Dr. Daly was that he always had a white envelope in his dark blue suit in the front pocket. When you got into class, you knew that you had to immediately get your pencil and paper ready because he would, two or three times out of the week, he would immediately give a pop uh, test, 10 point pop test. And on the outside of his office was a big chart. And what you made on that test was really what you were going to wind up your grade with. And so everybody knew what everybody was doing on those pop tests. But he'd come in, he'd, he would stand there for a moment, and he'd smile real big, and then he'd whip out that number 10 envelope, <laughs> say number one. So you had to be ready. And so uh, two or three times out of the week, we would have those immediate pop tests, and that was a grade uh, we'd make at the end of the of the semester. Well, today we're going to have a pop test, okay? And so I want it's going to be a true and false pop test, and uh, I'll give you the answers, but I want you to participate in it, okay? It may be true and false, and at the end I'll explain why they're true and false, okay? All right. Here's the first question, our first statement. People are basically good. They just need to, to get a little forgiveness from God. False. We'll get the answers later on on why, why those things are false. Number two, in the day of judgment when God opens the books of justice, he's going great on the curve. False. When I'm justified, God declares that I am now perfect. True. All right. When I am justified, I am now made perfect. False. Justification is a legal sentence under which God declares that I am now free from the guilt of all my sin and am a perfect person in His sight. True. Okay. Condemnation is a legal sentence of guilt and subsequent wrath from God and all men were at one time condemned before God. True. Jesus died a substitutionary death for every person who's ever lived. False. Again, we'll explain these later on. Every person is born with faith. We just need to know how to direct that faith. False. We're saved by our faith. False. I'll explain that later. Okay. I'm not a heretic, so I'll explain that later. Faith produces the new birth. False. The Holy Spirit produces the new birth. True. Just as long as a person is sincere, there are many different roads to God. False. If I believe that Jesus is God, that He died for sin, and that He was resurrected from the dead, then I am a believer, and I am on my way to heaven. 
false. Jesus' death covered over the sins of his people. That is called expiation. True. Christ's imputed righteousness equals full and immediate sanctification. False. When I was chosen by God in eternity, I was eternal sa eternally saved at that time. False. Jesus' death turned away the wrath of God that would ordinarily have fallen upon believers. That is called propitiation. That's true. The folks in the Old Testament were saved in a slightly different way than we are saved today. False. The folks in the Old Testament did not have the Holy Spirit to regenerate them because the Holy Spirit only came later on the day of judgment. On the day of Pentecost, I mean. False. Jesus' perfect life and substitutionary death are the grounds of my salvation. True. If Jesus had sinned one time, he could not have been my Savior. That's true. God's grace and mercy are one and the same. That's false. The crucifixion was absolutely necessary in order to prove that Jesus was willing to die for us. False. Abraham was justified by God when he willingly offered up Isaac on the altar. False. Three more. David was saved when Christ completed his substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. False. Paul, out of his own volition or free will, put his faith in Christ. False. Nicodemus was saved when he helped Joseph bury uh, Jesus' body. I don't know. It could be true or false. Okay? All right. We'll talk about that a little later on. All right. Well, as you know, as we've been studying through, uh, we've looked at bad news all the way through the first, three, uh, first two and a half chapters. Um, in fact, if you will, turn in your Bibles or turn on your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Let me reread what Bob covered last week, and we'll just reread it for the background because it is the background to the six verses we're going to be looking at today. When Paul says, What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not, a, not at all. For we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, or under sin, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God, all have turned aside, together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave, they use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asp is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery. In the way of peace they've not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now that is a picture of everyone in this room by nature. And then Paul uh, summarizes verses 19 to 20, which is the immediate context uh, in which we're going to find our passage today. When he says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. And then verse 20, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now the passage we're going to be looking at in verse 21 to to 26 is probably the clearest and most full explanation of the gospel in all of the Bible. It is a theological explanation of John 3.16. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now that's a very simple statement and a child can understand that. But Paul comes along here in chapter 3, beginning verse 21, and actually goes all the way through chapter 11, and he begins to explain 
the details of the good news of the gospel. And he's going to use theological terms that we must understand in order to understand what he's saying here, and which will help us to really put meat on the bones with regard to the gospel. Now, I want you to listen to what two outstanding professors uh, and, and Bible teachers had to say about this in later passage in Romans. Curtis Vaughn, who was a professor of Greek at uh, Southwestern Seminary and has written several really good commentaries, had this to say. He says, It has been said that if one misunderstands this passage, Romans 3, verse 21, all the way through 31, he runs the risk of misunderstanding the entire Roman letter. Luther called it the chief point and the very central place of the letter and of the whole Bible. And then James Montgomery Boyce, the distinguished pastor of the 10th Presbyterian Church in, in Philadelphia and a tremendous writer, had this to say. Understanding the Bible depends in no small measure on understanding the Bible's main words, words like justification, redemption, faith, substitution, obedience, grace, and many others. These are the words we're going to run into in this passage. No one can claim really to understand the Bible unless he or she knows something about the meaning of these terms. So now we're going to look at, at this, these verses. Uh, we're going to break them down into 11 different phrases and uh, try to add an explanation with regard to each phrase. Paul begins in verse 21 with a phrase that's used in several places in the Bible, but now, but now. Paul is in con contrasting what he'd immediately said in verse 20 with what he's going to be saying in the following verses. Verse 20 says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since the law through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The majority of the people in, in this world believe that somehow we're justified by keeping certain laws, God's laws in, in particular. Matter of fact, if you go out on the street, I would venture to say if you ask 10 people on the street, how does a person get to heaven, at least 9 out of 10 will begin to tell you, well, you've got to be sincere, you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you can't do this, and so forth. Most people believe that they are justified in some way by keeping God's law. But Paul is going to begin this passage and say, but now there's a different way. There's only one way. So he says, but now. What does he mean by but now? Well, uh, that's both uh, a historical term and uh, uh, deal with time and also with condition. But now, we're all sinful and undone, and no man can, can uh, get in God's grace or in his favor by keeping the law. But now there's a way to have righteousness apart from law. So Paul is going to say, but now you were dead in your sins and trespasses, but now you're made alive in Christ Jesus. So that's the first phrase, but now. Second phrase, Paul continues, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. There's no way that we can Inherit God's favor by trying to be obedient to the law. Rather, it's through the law that we come to the knowledge of sin. But Paul says, there is a righteousness that God has manifested apart from the law. And that righteousness is Christ's imputed righteousness. Now, that's a word that we don't use very often, imputed. But the Scriptures teach that Christ has imputed His righteousness to us. What that means is that while He was here on this earth, He worked out a perfect righteousness. He obeyed God completely. He never violated in thought, word, or deed, or motive any of God's laws. And He did that so that you and I might have a righteousness set to our account. It's imputed. It, that doesn't make us righteous, uh, this imputed righteousness. But in God's eyes, we become perfectly righteous. 
Now I'm going to use an illustration. Many of you know like to, that know that I like to hunt and I like to fish and I like to play golf. Well, let's suppose that I decided I was going to go to Bass Pro Shop and I was going to buy everything that I could possibly see. And I bought everything. And on top of that, I didn't have a job. On top of that, my house payment was 10 payments behind. And I had no income coming in. And then after shopping at Bass Pro Shop, then I went over to Academy Sports and just bought the place out. Then I went to Gander Mountain and bought them out. And uh, then I went to Tom Fort Thompson's over in North Little Rock and bought them out and put it all on a credit card, and that wasn't enough. Then I started visiting all the golf shops, and I bought clubs, and I bought bags, and I bought balls, and attire, and so forth. And then, then the bills started coming in, and I had no way to pay for them. But let's suppose Tom Arnold said, all right, I'm being deep pocket, said, all right. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help this fellow out. So he contacts Johnny Morris, who owns all the Bass Pro Shops, and he says, look, I'm going to send money over there, and I'm going to take care of Curtis Thomas's bills. And he goes to Academy Sports, and he takes care of all those bills. And he goes to Fort Thompson, and he goes to the golf shop, and he takes care of all those and has all of that set to his account. He, he imputed his credit worthiness to my account. He didn't create the debt. I created the debt. But he, he imputed all that to my account. And so when Bass Pro and Academy Sports and Fort Thompson <clears throat> looked at me, they didn't see me as a debtor. They saw me as having a perfect account with no bills on it. Why? Because someone had his credit worthiness imputed to my account, set to my account. And so I was no longer responsible for those bills. Someone else took on the responsibility. Now Christ not only imputed His righteousness to our account, but He also had our sin set to His account. That did not make Him sinful, just as it did not make uh, Tom at all uh, a, a, a debtor but it was all set to our account by Christ his righteousness was set to our account and our sins were set to his account now what Paul is talking about here is the righteousness of God it's from God it is of God it's not of man man does not add one iota to it Christ did it all for us and so when God looks down from heaven he sees us as perfectly righteous because of what Christ did on our behalf. That is imputed righteousness. We could not work it out. That's what Paul was telling us in the first part of this chapter, that there's none righteous, no, not one. And yet Christ comes along out of his great love for us, and he works out a perfect righteousness which is imputed to our account. And so when God looks down from heaven, he sees perfect people for those who have trusted in Christ. And it's totally apart from the law. Then Paul explains in, in the next phrase, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. It was apart from the law. But it's borne witness to by the Old Testament. That's what the law and the prophets means. It's a, a phrase describing the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament from Genesis 3.15 through the rest of the Old Testament we have the types and the shadows and the prophecies of this gospel. It starts in Genesis 3.15 when the, when the seed of the woman crushes the head of Satan and Satan crushes his heel. And all the way through the Old Testament we have all these wonderful prophecies of this righteousness that's going to be ours because of what Christ has done for us. As a matter of fact, if you want to turn back to Isaiah chapter 53, let me just read just one section of that chapter about what Christ has done for us. <clears throat> I'm going to begin reading verse 7. 
Well, I'll, I'll begin reading verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of his anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his, by his by, excuse me, and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. And so all through the Old Testament we have these wonderful prophecies of the coming one who was going to be our substitute on the cross and who was going to have our sins imputed on him and his righteousness imputed or set to our account. And then Paul continues in the next phrase, how we obtain this righteousness. He says, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. The righteousness of God. Man cannot achieve that righteousness. There is no way he can be sufficiently righteous to inherit God's grace and mercy. Notice it's the righteousness of God. And the notice it's through faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul emphasizes that twice. It is through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. It's not good enough just to say it one time. He has to say it twice in the phrase. Through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. It's not by works of the law. It's not by sincerity. It's not by being a member of the right church. It's not by doing good deeds or not doing bad deeds. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, what is faith? Faith is not just believing about something. Biblical faith is a confident a reliance or a trust in what Jesus Christ has done for us. You know, the Scriptures tell us that even the devils believe and shudder. It's not sufficient just to believe about something. There must be an absolute confidence and reliance. And that's what faith is. It's a trust or a reliance on Christ Jesus having forgiven you of your sins based on the faith which he's given to you. And so it's a faith that's given and this righteousness that, that we must have, perfect righteousness, comes through faith and trust and reliance in Jesus Christ. And I believe part of that faith is, is our repentance of our sins. I think that's all part of it. We must recognize that, that we need a Savior because of our sins and we put all of our hope and confidence in, what, in the perfect sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul adds the next phrase, for there is no distinction. That's a great phrase. Isn't it wonderful that God doesn't make a distinction, that it applies to all nationalities, all races, uh, all members of all different type churches. It applies to, to the rich and the poor. It applies to those who are well-educated and those who have little education. It applies to regardless of age, as long as a person is trusting in Christ, 
There is no distinction. Now, Paul probably has immediate reference here to the Jews and the Gentiles because the Jews looked down on the, on the Gentiles, thought they were dirty, filthy dogs. But Paul says there is no distinction. It's all based on those who have their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And aren't you glad that God didn't require us to, to reach a certain plateau or, or be born of a certain nation or be born with a certain amount of intelligence? There is no distinction. It's for everyone who has trust and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he explains why there's no distinction. He says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's not an exception. Everyone, every human being who's ever been born falls short of the glory of God. And what does it mean by that? God requires man to be absolutely perfect. And there's no way we can be that. Christ has to be our perfection. We fall short. What does that mean? Well, if I got held out here on the banks of the Arkansas River and grabbed a football and tried to throw a football all the way across the Arkansas River, it would fall short. It wouldn't reach the goal. The same way, our, we may have some good actions and some good deeds and some good motives on occasion but it falls woefully short of the glory of God it must be we must be absolutely perfect in motive in attitudes in words in thoughts and deeds and we all fall short and so Paul says this righteousness must come through the Lord Jesus Christ and then he says and are justified by His grace as a gift. The word justified means to be declared right. doesn't mean to be made right. That's sanctification. Justification means that you're declared by Almighty God to be perfect in His sight. And he says, by His grace. The word grace means unmerited favor. It means that God has given His enemies a favor that they don't deserve. By the way, the word uh, grace is used 155 times in the New Testament. And it's, Paul goes on and say, says that it is an absolute gift and are justified by His grace, declared right by His unmerited favor as a gift. I remember years ago we were teaching a class on Romans in a, in a, in a home. And a man was sitting in the back of the class and when it finally hit him that salvation was by grace, he jumped up in the back of the room and he said, that is just like welfare. You get something you don't deserve. And we said, yeah, you got it. That's true. We get something we don't deserve. Paul says we're justified by his grace as a gift. One, per one theologian said, Grace is necessary to desire salvation, to know the truth, to avoid sin, to act well, to pray fittingly, to begin to have faith, and to persevere in faith. All that is out of God's wonderful grace. And then Paul now explains how it all works. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's a word that used, was used when, when slaves would be bought out of slavery. They would be redeemed. Uh, we use it nowadays when we, uh, in connection with pawn shops, you know, if you if you buy a wonderful boat and then, then realize, well, I didn't have the money to buy that, and so you you go to a pawn shop and you you give them title to your boat, and uh, and they hold it till you finally get enough money to come get your boat back. You redeem it from the pawn shop. Well, uh, Paul explains that's what we've been, what's happened to us. We've been redeemed out of Satan's kingdom into the kingdom of his, of his Son, and that redemption is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Then Paul goes a little bit deeper theologically when he says, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Propitiation is a big word. It means to have the wrath of God turned aside. Now, if you read the RSV when it comes to this passage, it uses the word expiation. The word expiation means 
for it to cover our sins. And certainly Christ's death covers our sins. But it does more. He turns away the wrath of God. Now that's something that's not taught in a lot of churches today because people don't want to be thinking about God as a God of wrath. <clears throat> but God does exercise and inflict wrath upon His enemies. And we were by nature enemies of God. But Christ comes along and by His sacrifice on the cross He turns away the wrath of God that would justly fall upon us. It falls upon Him and He suffers hell in our place. Uh, recently there was a, uh, a group of Presbyterians who wanted to come up with a new hymnal and they wanted to come up with the last song that we just sang and put it in the hymnal uh, in Christ alone. But uh, uh, they wrote uh, the author uh, Keith Getty and asked if they could take out a phrase uh, out of the hymn you probably remember that and they would and Keith would not give them permission to do that and I want to I want to read that phrase that they wanted to take out I want to read this uh, the second stanza in Christ alone who took on flesh fullness of God and helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. They wanted to take out the phrase, the wrath of God was satisfied. And I'm so thankful that Keith Getty would not let them take that out. They did not want a hymn in their songbook, in their hymnal, uh, that talked about God being satisfied. Uh, and the wrath of God being satisfied. And so he would not take it out, and so that hymn is not in their, in their hymn book. But this is what Paul teaches in this passage. Uh, when Christ gave his blood on the cross, the wrath of God was satisfied. All the wrath that God had stored up for all of his enemies, for those who come to him in faith, was finally satisfied, and the wrath of God was laid on His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's an awesome thought. God punishing His own Son in our place and in our stead, giving His life freely, feeling, feeling the full effect of God's wrath for all of His people, and the wrath of God was satisfied. And then Paul closes this section with a couple of explanations. He says, This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. What he's saying here is that in the Old Testament, uh, for those who, who have trusted in Christ, uh, God didn't immediately execute judgment on them. He, he was patient in His forbearance. He passed over those until the Christ could come and die on the cross for their sins. And then he closes with this final explanation. He says, It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What Paul is saying here is that every sin, I don't care how big and how small it is, is going to be dealt with, was dealt with by Jesus Christ on the cross or is going to be dealt with by the lost person in eternal hell. God never sweeps anything under the carpet. I don't care how small a bad thought it is. I don't care how minor a motive, bad motive it is. Every sin will be dealt with. Either in the person who's not turned to Christ in faith. Either in them forever and ever in hell. Or, or it was laid on Jesus Christ and he satisfied God's wrath. God is just. He doesn't just wink at sin. He doesn't uh, sweep sin under the carpet. Either the person carries his sins eternally in hell, and they're punished forever and ever and ever, or Christ had that sin laid on him, and he satisfied the justice of Almighty God. And so Pete Getty was right. The wrath of God was satisfied. So, What's the big picture in Romans 3, 21 to chapter 20, uh, verse 26? 
Here it is. In order to be totally holy and just, God must deal with sin. By His grace, He sent Jesus into the world to bear the sins of all who would be brought to Him by faith. As Christ shed His blood for us, He satisfied God's justice. Christ accomplished that by taking upon Himself the wrath that we justly deserve. That is the gospel. That is the good news. That's what Paul is saying here in these six verses. William Tyndall, back in the 15th century, said that the gospel signifieth good, merry, glad, and sinful tidings that maketh a man's heart glad and maketh him sing, dance, and leap for joy. Can you sing, dance, and leap for joy knowing that this gospel is your hope and your confidence? That's what Romans chapter 3 and really what the rest of Romans is going to be about. Now I want to go back to our pop quiz just a second after having pointed that, those things out. Let's go back to the first one. People are basically good. They just need to get a little forgiveness from God. Obviously, that's false. We need God's uh, Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for all of our sins. In the day of judgment, when God opens the books of justice, you're going to grade us on the curb. Absolutely not. That's false. God grades on the basis of perfection. Either we're perfect, which we're not, or Jesus Christ lived a perfect life for us. When I'm justified, God declares that I am now perfect. Absolutely correct. God declares us now perfect. Even though we're not, He declares us. That's, uh, th that's our justification. When I'm justified, I'm now made perfect. No, I wish it were so, but unfortunately it's not. Our sanctification begins, but we will not be made perfect until the Lord takes us to glory. Justification is a legal sentence under which God declares that I'm now perfect from the guilt of all of my sin and am a perfect person in His sight. Absolutely correct. Condemnation is a legal sentence of guilt and subsequent wrath from God, and all men were at one time condemned before God. That's true. Jesus died a substitutionary death for every person who's ever lived. That's false. He died only for those who would be brought to faith in Him. Every person is born with faith. He just needs to know how to direct that faith. Unfortunately, that's not true. Not biblical faith, anyway. We're saved by our faith. No, we're not. We're saved by what Christ did. Our faith is what attaches us to Christ. It brings us to Christ. The faith, the, the work of Christ is our ground of our salvation. He is what saves us. The gift of faith is what brings us to our Savior. Faith produces the new birth. That's false. The Holy Spirit produces the new birth. From the new birth comes faith, from repentance and faith. The, the Holy Spirit produces the new birth. That's true. Just as long as a person is sincere, there are many roads to God. Unfortunately, a lot of people believe that's true, but it is absolutely false. If I believe that Jesus is God, that He died for sin, and that He was resurrected from the dead, then I am a believer. I'm on my way to heaven. That's false. The devil believes that. No. Faith involves more than belief. We have to believe, but faith involves a trust and a reliance. And so faith is not just a mere fee, uh, belief about something. It includes a trust and reliance. Jesus' death covered over the sins of His people. That is called expiation. That's true. Christ imputed righteousness equals full and immediate sanctification. That's false. Christ's imputed righteousness equals full and immediate justification. When I was chosen by God in eternity, I was eternally saved at that point. No, we're not saved until we're brought to faith in Christ. We were chosen, and it was guaranteed that we're going to be saved. But we're, we're saved when we're brought to faith in Christ. Jesus' death turned away the wrath of God that would ordinarily have fallen upon believers. That is called propitiation. That's true. That's true. 
Folks in the Old Testament were saved in a slightly different day, way than we're saved today. No, they're saved in exactly the way that we're saved, through the death and life of the Lord Jesus Christ. They looked forward to Christ while we look back to Christ. The, old, the folks in the Old Testament did not have the Holy Spirit to regenerate them because the Holy Spirit only came later on the day of Pentecost. That's false. They had to have the Holy Spirit in order to bring them to faith in Christ. The Holy Spirit came in a greater and fuller measure in the day of Pentecost. Jesus' perfect life and substitutionary death are the grounds of my salvation. That is true. That's how we're saved. If Jesus had sinned one time, He could not have been my Savior. That's true. We had to have a perfect Savior to have a perfect righteousness. God's grace and mercy are one and the same. No, they're very akin, but they're not the same. Grace is undeserved favor. Mercy carries the concept of compassion, forgiveness, and pardon. Someone has put it this way. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. That is the righteousness of God. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. That is the wrath of God. The crucifixion was absolutely necessary in order to prove that Jesus was willing to die for us. No. The crucifixion was necessary in order for God to inflict wrath upon His only Son in our place, in our stead. David was saved when Christ completed His substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. No. David was saved when he was brought to faith in the Savior who was going to come. Paul, out of his own volition of free will, put his faith in Christ. No, faith is a gift of God, not out of his own volition. Absolutely, man has to act, but faith is itself a gift of God. And I've already answered, Nicodemus was saved when he helped Joseph bury <laughs> Jesus' body. We don't know when he was saved, whether when... when uh, Jesus explained to him in John 3 that he must be born again, or when he helped, uh, when he defended Jesus before the Sanhedrin, or when he helped uh, Joseph bear the body, or later. We, and we don't even know for sure that he was saved. But if he was saved, there was only one way, and that's by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. Now I want to close before we have the, have the uh, uh, Lord's Supper. Uh, by reading the hymn that we that we sang. If I can find it here. You want to put it up on the screen? Can you do that? Well, I'll just turn around and read it. Can you put it up there? In, in Christ alone? Yeah. All right. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave He rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. For life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I stand. And I don't doubt that as Keith Getty was writing that, that wonderful hymn, which is, by the way, is my favorite uh, uh, contemporary hymn. 
They was probably looking at these six verses in Romans chapter 3. Bob? Well, what a wonderful passage of Scripture to reflect on this morning. We could kind of stop down and take each phrase and just meditate on each phrase in those verses and find depth and richness in all of that. I, I don't know how you react to the idea that you're a welfare recipient. You hear that, and there's probably something in you that goes, no, no, wait, no, wait, I'm, I'll take care of myself. And that's true for us spiritually, too. There's something in us that wants to self-justify, that wants to say, I'll, I'll take care of it. We have to come to an understanding that we can't. There's, there's no goodness in us that satisfies the wrath of God, only the goodness of Christ. When we come to that realization, we recognize how great the grace of God is, and we are humbled by that, and there's great joy that comes in that. And that's what this meal reminds us of and pictures for us what a this passage is at the heart of this meal the broken body and the shed blood of Christ is what is necessary for unrighteous men and women you and me to be made right before God there's nothing we can offer there's no goodness in us that brings us there it's only the finished work of Christ and that's what we come to celebrate each week so if you're here this morning as a guest or as a visitor uh, you need to know that we practice open communion. That means that anyone here who knows and loves Christ is welcome at the table. We, uh, we trust you to examine your own heart and conscience and to, uh, to know that you are a child of God before you come to receive the bread and the juice. If you're here this morning and you're unsure about that, rather than coming and receiving bread and juice or wine, we'd encourage you to have a conversation, have a dialogue with either who brought you or I'd be happy to talk to you. I know there are others here who'd love to speak with you. Um, but but uh, this, this is a meal for those who know they are children of God to come and to feast on our, our uh, understanding of, our, our reflection on the goodness of God on our behalf. So the way we'll do it is come down the outer aisles, receive the elements, take them back to your seats. We'll take them together in just a minute. You take a minute to prepare your heart while I prepare the table, and then we'll come to the table together.
as Jesus had the Passover meal with his disciples, he took bread, he broke it, and he uh, passed it to them. He said, this is my body broken for you. He was talking about being the propitiation for their sin, the satisfaction of God's wrath. They didn't realize it at the time. They would come to understand it. Uh, but he said, as often as you come together, do this in remembrance of me. And so this morning, Lord, uh, we do this to remind ourselves that we are indeed welfare recipients and that your wrath has been satisfied not because of any righteousness of our, our own, but because of the, the finished work of your son bearing the penalty, the wrath that we deserve. We receive this now with grateful hearts as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. In the same way as the meal was concluded, Jesus took the cup he prayed a prayer of blessing, and then he passed it, and he said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the remission of your sins. As often as you drink this, remember me. And so again this morning, Lord, we do remember that we are made clean by your sacrifice. We are justified by faith in the one who alone could pay the price that we deserved. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins as we feast on Christ in our hearts. Amen. Stand with me, if you would. We're going to sing just the chorus to the song Canons. You are holy, great, and mighty. The moon and the stars declare who you are. We'll sing that together, and then I'll dismiss us with a benediction. You are holy, great and mighty, the moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever, my heart will sing of how great you are. And now receive this benediction from God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen. You're dismissed. We'll see you next week.